Pat Novak for hire. I'm Pat Novak for hire. That's what the sign out in front of my office says. Pat Novak for hire. It's easy to rent yourself out and you make a few bucks, but sooner or later you get burned. It doesn't make any difference whether you're a man or a mouse. Because down on the waterfront in San Francisco, they build the traps both ways. Oh, everything looks easy, but sometimes they fool you, like putting shatterproof glass in a fire alarm box. And you got to watch out every minute. Because down here, if you reach out to help a panhandler, the guy will take your arm and hand you back the dime. I rent boats and deal any place. I'll give you a good trade-in on a second-hand sole. Works out all right. Sometimes you're on top of the heap, if you like the kind of heaps they got down here. But you got to get your laughs in a hurry, because you find out right away you're not going to make any more headway than a hummingbird in a wind tunnel. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. It must have been about 3 o'clock. The sun was out down at the far end of the bay. It put a head on the clouds down there and put the rest of the sky in a good mood. Over across the bay, it was a warm, easy yellow that made you think of a pound cake full of eggs. It was too nice a day to work inside, so I closed shop and started down to a pool hall on Market Street. I never got there, because on the way I stopped by the laundry to pick up a couple of shirts. It started right there, when the clerk walked over to me. He was full of fizz, and the sort of guy who gets a bottle of hand lotion for his birthday. Well, well, Mr. Novak, is it? I don't know, is it? Uh, yes. My, we have a nice day, haven't we? Yeah, I want some laundry. Uh, not any better than yesterday, though. Not a bit better than yesterday. What do you do? Give them all a rating? How about the laundry, huh? Uh, yes. Let's have the ticket. All right. Mm. Huh? 428. That should be right down here. It's just a couple of shirts. 28. Yes, yes, here it is. That'll be a dollar eighty-four, please. Well, sounds like a fair price, but I'll take my own. Own? Own? This isn't mine. It's too big. Are you sure? Look, I had a couple of white shirts. Now, you better look again. Well, the, the tickets match, you see, for 28. You must be wrong, Mr. Novak. Now, look, fella, shirts don't swell. They shrink. The package is too big. Too, too big? Oh, well, we better open it. Yes. Well, see, I, I can wrap them again easily. Don't worry. Yeah. It, uh... It's not my shade of pink. Oh. I guess it's not yours. Thanks. Here's some men's clothing, too. How about these shirts? If I were a jockey, I'd take them. I want my own. Well, yes, yes, of course you'd do it. Oh, goodness, I don't know what to do with myself. Yeah, you got a problem. How about these shirts, though? Oh, we've mixed up the tickets, and someone has your package. Who? I don't know. Maybe we can check on the collar markings. Let me see. Yeah. Yes, now, let me check in the book. Here we are. Uh, this laundry belongs to Earl Hayes. Yeah, where's he live? Uh, are you going up there? I want my shirts back. Uh, yes. He lives at uh, 321 Dorset Place. Yeah, give me that. Gun. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Novak, and please apologize to Mr. Hayes. I'm so angry at myself, I don't know what to do. Yeah, be careful you don't stop a hole in the floor. See you later. <laughs> He was wringing his hands and shifting from one foot to another like a small kid in a department store. On the way up to Dorset Place, I looked at the bundle. There were a couple of women's blouses and four loud-colored shirts. Two of them looked like a Navajo blanket somebody would sewed buttons on. I tried to wrap up the bundle, and about ten minutes later, I got to 321 Dorset Place. It was up on Telegraph Hill, and it was an old place somebody would remodeled. It was supposed to be modernistic, but it reminded you of a chromium-plated tool shed. Apartment 2A was on the second landing. I went up there and knocked. Earl Hayes didn't answer the door, but you couldn't quarrel with what you got. She was in her 30s and pushing 40 hard enough to bruise it. But she looked good standing here in the doorway, long and lean enough to make a greyhound turn in his card. 
She was wearing green lounging pajamas, and you've seen bananas in looser skins. You could see the bay behind her through the window, and she stood there brushing back enough red hair to sell to a mattress factory. And as she pushed the door back, she started to smile. Her lips were a pale red color and moist enough to put a desert on its feet. And you could tell she thought she used him to talk when you got tired of everything else. Standing there in front of her, you got the same feeling you would if somebody pressed the treble and bass key of an organ at the same time. Hello. What are you selling? Shirts. Is your husband home? Should I have one? I don't know. It depends on the climate. Come on in anyway. All right. Who are you? My name's Novak. I'm looking for a guy named Earl Hayes. You better sit down. It won't take me that long. He's got my shirts. Mr. Novak, you don't look like the kind who'd lose his shirt. I don't want jokes, lady. There was a mix-up down at the laundry. I got Hayes' stuff, and he walked off with mine. Is that his stuff in the bundle? Yes, it is. Here. All right, put it on the table here. We'll see. I don't think you're smart, Mr. Novak. Huh? Where's the other shirt? You got them all right there. There's one missing. All right, see the laundry. All I want's a trade. There must have been another shirt in this bundle. Maybe it was too dirty. The boy couldn't clean it that fast. Now, look, friend, if you want to argue, go ride a streetcar. I came up for two white shirts. Now, where are they? I suppose Earl Hayes has them. And where's he? I'll send it to him, but I'm afraid you won't like him. Then I'll be lonely. Just tell me where he is. Two floors up. That'll give you time to work over that story. Yeah. Because he'll know you're lying. He'll want to know about that shirt. What makes it that important? The fact that it's missing. I'll find him upstairs. I hope it works into a friendship. Yeah. But I don't think it will. He'll know you're lying and you'll get tossed around like a green salad. Is he tougher than you? No, he's just not as versatile. Good luck, darling. When she said good luck, you knew she was just being polite and didn't mean it any more than the hangman when he tells you to watch your step. When I left, she was over by the window, leaning back against the table, as shy as a runaway boxcar. And you got the idea she'd be fun to know if you had a lot of money and an oxygen tent. Well, I rolled up the bundle, and I started for the fourth floor. I knocked on the door, and when it opened, I knew I had high bid for trouble. I could see into the room, and there were three or four Ghanifs sitting inside. They had a dull, anxious look, as if they were trying to find another worm to pull apart. They were the sort of guys who might have been born, but you wouldn't want to bet on it. The one in the door was a big guy with bushy eyebrows that met near his nose, and the way they ran across his face, you got the idea he got tired of the old ones and grafted on a vine instead. His face wasn't much better. It looked more like a relief map than a face. It was pockmarked in the color of moldy bread, and you knew if a woman kissed him, she'd get blood poisoning. Hello, Novak. You Earl Hayes? Enough to suit you. Come in. Uh, you're good at guessing names. So a little bird told me. Yeah, I saw her. She's got nice feathers. Where's the shirt? Here's the bundle. Take your pick. I don't like any of these, Novak. That's all I got. Where's the shirt, Novak? Just wear a collar, mister. You don't need a shirt. <laughs> yeah, I won't need a memory for you, fella. Suit yourself. Tell me about those shirts. Hello, well, come on in. We got your boy. Who is he? You made a deal. You know his name. I never saw him before, Max. He looks different now. He came up with some of your shirts. That's true. I went by the laundry. Said a guy named Novak picked up the shirts. Except one of them's missing. Couldn't be missing. They're all in one bundle. Ask him then, but do it nice. He's touchy. He doesn't have to ask. Now, look, mister, if you're Earl Hayes, I want my shirts. Give us the other one. We'll make a trade. You got the best deal you're going to make, Hayes. Now, I want those shirts. Get yourself a loom, then. All right, Joe, get his on. Uh, Wait a minute, Max. Sit down, Hayes, or we'll take your ticket away. That's it. Now, get his other arm. Over oh, oh, there. Why don't you keep your eye on Hayes? All right, Novak. It's you or Hayes. Make up your mind. I got it made up about you. <laughs> You're going to tie her first, Novak. Where's that shirt? I don't know. Try Hayes. He looks healthy. <laughs> Hold him up. He's slipping. Do you need handles? Hold him up. You're running out of chances, Novak. Where's that shirt? I don't know. <laughs> Hold him up. Why? If you can't find the reason, don't. All right, Hayes. How's your temper? I slid down to the floor so fast I almost went under the varnish. And I spent the next couple of hours checking on the termites. It was getting dark when I woke up and right away the room was full of company. The host was Earl Hayes, and he was lying on the floor as dead as a cracked bell. He was over by the desk, lying on his back and grabbing at the rug like a Hoover vacuum. 
The hair was wet against his head, and the perspiration on his forehead started to break up and run down like tears. So you got the idea he cried out of his hairline instead of his eyes. He didn't seem pained or put off. He was smiling a little as if he realized he had a better deal. Over by the door, Hellman was talking to a couple of coppers. He sent them downstairs and walked over to me. You woke the neighbors, Novak. I don't snore that loud, Hellman. You made the noise with Hayes? Yeah. How'd I get my face this way? You look better to me, Novak. How long you been here? A couple hours. That fits in. The coroner's already been here. He says Hayes was beat to death an hour ago with that poker out of the fireplace. You better check on the prince. I already sent it down. You slept too long. Oh, Inspector. We can by for the step. Oh, he's right there. Tell the morgue to keep him out till I get down. Yes. Come on, Joe. That's it. Grab him. Sure is a little guy. Well, Barry, easy. Tell him I'll check in at eight. So well, Inspector. All right, Novak, tell me all about it. I came up here for a shirt. That's not hard to get. What about Hayes? How'd the beef go? It went both ways with a guy named Max. You better talk to him. I like you better. Oh, you're not bright, Hellman. I've been out of the game for two hours. Look, big shot, don't push me around. You got a story? Maybe it's good, maybe it's not. You could have taken Hayes and run into trouble yourself. That's the hard way, Hellman. I don't like your whip. Get another boy. You'll do, Novak, and you'll do it all downtown. Yeah, Hellman talking. What do you mean you can't send him up yet? Who's in charge down there? Give me the guy in charge. Huh? Well, two guys just came up here. You must have sent them. They were here. You must have sent them. Yeah. Well, you can send them for me. Don't tell me, Hellman. Well, it couldn't happen. No, it couldn't happen to anybody but you, Hellman. It's going to look real good, too, when they find out you let two strangers walk in and steal a body. I don't understand it. It's simple, Hellman. You better go in and rob that bed right now. Ah. Because when they're through kicking you around down at headquarters, you're going to need a sling. And with a figure like yours, it'll take a good-sized bed sheet. <laughs> When Hellman hung up the phone, he turned the color of early summer squash. He stood over by the window, running his hand through his hair. He left the window and stood in the center of the room for a minute. His coat was open and his stomach was piled up on his belt in nice, even layers. It reminded you of a rolled-up garden hose. And the way his pants fit him when he walked, you got the idea somebody would sewed an anvil in the lining. After a while, he came over and started to talk to me. He kept pulling his ear, and in the dim light there, it looked like the cross-section of an eggplant. I'm still going to hold you, Novak. You'd look better with a hot potato, Hellman. I'm going to hold you for 12 hours. In the meantime, that body will show up. He didn't look that active to me. Wake up, Hellman. You've been backed into a corner. You better get a body first. Look, Novak, I know the guy was dead. I'm not going to sit on my hands. The most fun you'll ever have. I'm going to check those prints, and I'm going to find out why you were up here. I came to see Hayes. The laundry pulled a switch, and I came up for shirts. Check with the guy at the laundry. Yeah. And on the way downstairs, stop at 2A. Why? There's a souped-up redhead down there. You can ask her a question. You can do that with any woman. You can ask her who Max is. I went there to find Earl Hayes. She answered and sent me here. There's only one thing wrong with that story. Huh? There's no redhead in 2A. I checked all the apartments. 2A's been empty for three months. The people are out of town. Uh, I think you dreamed her. I don't dream that good in the afternoon. Look, Hellman, I'm walking out of this place, and all you can do is hear the echo. I want to see you go, Novak. Maybe you'll do something wrong, and I'll track you down. You couldn't track down a live bear in a telephone booth. I'll make a try on you, mister, and when I'm through, there'll be enough to put you right in that gas chamber. They can save money and do the same thing. Huh? They can lock me up in the same closet with you. <laughs> Hellman was wandering around like smoke in a drafty room. I picked up Earl Hayes' shirts and ducked by the laundry, but the clerk was gone and the place was closed tighter than the lid on a city scandal. Well, I tried to think back, but nothing made sense. In the first place, what made that shirt so important? And why did the laundry clerk have the wrong address for Earl Hayes? And the main hooker was that body disappearing. Why? If Max killed him, they were in the clear. Why take a gamble like that just for laughs? I knew I had to get some answers pretty soon because Hellman wasn't an easy guy. He was a tough, hard cop with a heart big enough to hide behind a piece of bird seed. Well, I had a couple of places to go, so I looked up Jocko Madigan. He's a good guy, and he used to be a smart one, except he didn't like the San Francisco fog and worked out one of his own. I finally found him in the hunt room at the Bellevue Hotel. The crowd was at one end, and he was down at the other. I found out why. Thank you, one for my baby and one more. Jocko. Ah, Pepsi. I'm singing a little sentimental ballad. All right, Jocko. Now, you've had enough. Pepsi, I'm as sober as the next man. I've been drinking since 8 o'clock this afternoon, and I'm as sober as the next man. Oh, stop it, will you? 
Patsy, you know I hate whiskey. But do you realize that 85% of the human body is liquid? Yeah. Now, is there any sane reason why all that should be water? Of course not. It isn't fair. That's why we have communists. Jaco, I'm in trouble. Of course you are. Knowing you, Patsy, is like walking hand in hand with a moral pygmy. All right. It's true, Patsy. You have no moral sense. All you have is a small bundle of regrets, something which you drag out periodically as proof of your decency. Will you listen? But you're not even decent enough to regret the things you've done. From some of your conversations about the only things you regret are the things you haven't done. The only reason you haven't caused more trouble is that you're not fleet-footed enough. All right, all right. You're hopeless, Patsy. You're like some overripe planet, disemboweled and thrown from the skies. You don't know where you're going, and you can't remember where you've been. Your only joy is motion, and your only sensations are heat and cold. You all through, Jocko? Yes. Uh, what kind of trouble? Hellman wants me for a dead guy. Where is he? He was up on Telegraph Hill, but he's gone now. He didn't die long, did he? Somebody took the body away. That's a funny thing to collect. Oh, none of the story lays right. The guy's name was Earl Hayes. There was a laundry mix-up, and I went up there to trade. Yes? Now, look, I want you to hop down and find out everything you can about Earl Hayes. Find out who his friends are. Find out where he's from. And see if there's a guy named Max anywhere, will you? Uh, where are you going? i got to find a girl. I felt that way myself earlier tonight. Will you hurry, Jocko? We don't have time to run your love life. Yes. Well, time is a minor drawback anyway. Good night, lover. It was nearly 11 when I walked out of the bar, and the way things were going, I couldn't beat a vagrancy rap with a pocket full of annuities. I had to find that girl someplace, but it wasn't going to be easy. You might as well try to French fry a kettle of bones. I went back up to that apartment to see if the, she left a pointer anywhere. Hellman had a copper out in front, but he was sitting in somebody's new Nash reading a comic book. I went all through the apartment, and on the way out, I spotted the matches in the wastebasket. The folder had been used up, and on the outside it said, Bonton Club, Duval Street, Key West, Florida. Well, that was the first break I got. Most people use their matches fast, so if she was using Key West matches, it must have meant something. I got onto a phone booth and started calling up the hotels. Finally, a hotel up on Taylor said they had a Miss Rhoda Warren on the register from Key West, Florida. For five bucks, a bellhop will tell you anything, so he said she was a redhead. I still didn't know, and when I went up there, she wasn't in. Well, I had to get back to my place for Jocko's call, and when I walked in, I got sorry about that five bucks. Hello, Mr. Novak. You keep bad hours. So do you, and your name's Rhoda Warren. You like the name? Yeah. Go ahead and use it. It's a phony. How about Max? I don't even know him. When you called him today, it was a wrong number. Oh, please, Mr. Novak. You're not big enough for menace. No? No, you're like everybody else on the waterfront. You got some muscles, a few stage whispers, and 30 cents in your pocket. So don't try to make a sale. Except you'd like to buy that shirt. Yeah, if you want to sell it. What makes it worth a thousand bucks? Your imagination. Five hundred will buy it. You're bad on guesses. Five hundred and Max will do it. Look, I don't have to deal with you, darling. You're a pauper on paper and in your pocket. So I can just sit tight while you sell or go broke. Where's Max? Sell him out. If I were in a hole, I'm not. You are. All right. Let go of my arm. I need some help, lady. I don't know whether you're making love or trouble. Either way, let go of my arm. Have you figured out yet? Please, you're, you're hurting my arm. Where's Max? Come on, I'll twist you until the skin comes loose. Where is he? Please, please don't. All right. I'll make your friends anyway. Yeah, Novak talking. Yeah, I've been out all evening. Whereabouts? Yeah, well, he can't use it anymore. Where are you, the Compton? Yeah, thanks. The laundry clerk? Yeah, he found that shirt. Tell him not to lose his own. And wish him good luck. Will he need it? Well, maybe not. But he ought to take it while it's cheap. I know it wouldn't do any good to press her for Max now. If she was going to tip her mitt, she'd do it on her own. I left my place and grabbed a cab for the piers. I got out near market and walked over to the laundry. The back window opened up like a hunk of sky after a bad rain. I found the shirt lying out on the table. It looked like the rest of her old Hayes shirts except for one thing. The collar was full of writing, a few letters and a lot of numbers. I took them down, left the shirt and headed for my place. I got one of those shirts from that bundle and copied in some of the same numbers. Then I picked up a cab for Rhoda Warren's hotel. 
for another fin, the bellhop went blind, and I got into her room about 12.30. Her room was empty, but her bags were packed on the bed. I took a 60-40 chance and planted the shirt in the bottom of one of the bags. I told the bellhop to tip me off when she came in, and I started back to my place to wait for Jocko's call. I did about as well as a bottle of scotch in a Louisville bar. A squad car picked me up at the corner and said Hellman had a call out for me. About 20 minutes later, we pulled up to Pier 19. Hellman was waiting there, moving around like a pea in a boiling stew. Hello, Novak. Walk me down the pier. Find a crutch. What's on your mind, Hellman? Walk me down the pier. All right, but I won't take your arm. We found the body. How? Radar? Almost. The Coast Guard boat spotted him floating in the bay. They radioed in. We're hauling him up now. Yeah. We're all busy. I found a shirt, too. Well, we may not need it. Those fingerprints worked out just right. Well, if they're mine, it's too pat, Hellman. You're too smart a cop to buy that kind of plant. I'm a smart enough cop to hold you, now that we got Earl Hayes. Here we are. Yeah. Yeah, got him down there. Yeah, we're passing him out. Grab a hold there. Here, I'll get him. All right, ball. There. Well, that water sure changed him, Hellman. There's a mistake. He read his identification. He said it was Earl Hayes. Another plant, Hellman. He's the laundry clerk. What was he doing out in the bay? Maybe that's the way they do the laundry now. Well, I'm going home, Hellman. You better stand on his chest. Huh? That way they can't steal him without taking you, too. Well, that 6040 was beginning to pay off. Somebody was gathering up the loose ends, and it was going to be easier now because things were getting tight. But you can say that for a lot of wedding rings. So I bummed a ride, and I got to my place about a half hour later. I had some trouble there because the cop on duty wanted to take me down to Pier 19 again. He looked wistful, so I told him about a place down the street where he might catch a peeping Tom, and I finally got rid of him long enough to get up to the room. As I walked in the door, the phone was ringing. Yep. This is Jocko. What'd you find out? Earl Hayes was popular. Anybody could have killed him. For instance? There's a lot on him in the Chronicle Morgue. He's wanted for smuggling. Yeah? What else? He had a girlfriend. Her picture's here. What's she look like? Oh, I haven't had enough experience. Uh, it's the same one, I guess. What else? And Earl Hayes once served a prison term with a man named Max Stoffer. That's our boy. What do you got on him? He lives here now, and he runs a business out on Van Ness Avenue. What kind of business? Oh, it's going to sound funny. He runs a funeral parlor. Well, what does that prove? It doesn't prove a thing. Just because you're a perfume salesman, you don't have to smell pretty. <laughs> When Jocko hung up, everything began to slip into place. I could see now why everybody wanted that shirt, and the reason why Earl Hayes disappeared was ten feet tall. I called Hellman. He said he knew all about Max Stoffer, and we had a squad car on the way out. I met him at the corner of Geary and Taylor, and we rode out to Van Ness. Max Stoffer's funeral parlor was over near Pine. When we pulled up, the lights were out except for a lamp in the front room. Hellman walked in the front door without knocking, and we turned in where the light was. It was a big night for stiffs, and there were three or four caskets along the wall. In the center, over near the fireplace, there was a casket on wheels. The plate on the outside said a man named Peter Dawson had the lease. Hellman was about to start upstairs when a door in the back opened. Hello, Novak. What are you doing here? Is the man with you dead? Not too dead to talk to you, Stuffer. He's Inspector Hellman from Homicide. The bag looks heavy. You talking to you or me, Max? Where's she going? I'm putting her on that train, Novak. Do you care? It's up to Hellman. He wants you for killing Earl Hayes. I thought he disappeared. I'll add on the laundry clerk, too. After I visit the train. You put her on that train, she'll get off at the next station, Stoffer. Huh? She gave you a bad story. That shirt you got's a phony. Wait a minute. Save yourself some time, mister. Check her bag. Oh, he's crazy, Max. Make the odds, fella. Let me see that bag. Take a look. He's trying to stampede you, Max. Give it here. No, underneath there. The other side. There's no shirt in here. What are you trying? I don't know how it got there, Max. He must have put it there on us. I don't know how it got there. Something crazy's happened. You don't sound sure. Please, Max. Please, Max, stay away. I gave you the right shirt. <laughs> Max. Max, leave me alone. Max. Take a cup. Take her for the laundry guy. I'll read about you, lady. Max, you're crazy. You're crazy to tell him. I'll tell him all about it. I'll tell you every word. Cover. All right, don't forget yourself, big shot. Don't forget to tell him what you did with Earl Hayes. There's nobody. Oh, you silly fool. You silly fool. Don't you know why they're here? Shut up. You'll open them all. You better tell him now. He's in there, Hellman. He's in there with Peter Dawson. You had a chance, baby. <laughs> Leave me alone, Max. 
Leave me alone or I'll break you up. Can't win them all, Max. How do I let go? Leave me hey, Get away from her. You don't need the gun anymore. No. Pick it up, Cutler. Well, you had a big night, lady. Yeah. What happened, Novak? You put that shirt in there and you lied to him. Yeah. You lied to him and he thought I did. He thought I lied to him. What's the difference? As long as you kill him, you still get a prize. <laughs> next morning was easy for Hellman. He shook the girl for the story on those shirts. The markings on the collar were bill of lading numbers on stuff going to the islands. Everybody was being watched, so they had to handle it that way. Earl Hayes used to leave the shirts in that laundry, and each time somebody along the line marked one of the shirts. Hayes took the shirts to Max, and he got the information to the right people in the islands. Out there, they had a line on what to hijack. Most of the stuff was gold, and it was a good game for everybody, until that laundry clerk made a goofy mistake. He got the bundles mixed, and he left one shirt out. When Hayes picked up the wrong bundle, the girl and Max thought a double cross was underway. After Max worked me over and killed Hayes, he went down to the laundry shop, and he couldn't find the shirt. He could only think of one thing. Hayes had the shirt on. So he got him out of that apartment. Once he had him out, he figured the easy thing to do was to make him disappear for good. So he put him in a casket with another guy on his way to the boneyard. In the meantime, the clerk found the shirt and called me. The girl overheard the conversation and figured the laundry clerk had the shirt with him. She got in a beef and killed him. She went down to that laundry after me and picked up the shirt. Well, from there on, the cards fell the wrong way. Well, Hellman asked only one question. That laundry clerk was an innocent guy. Wasn't it too bad he got knocked off? Oh, I don't know. When you think of how many buttons you lose in a year, it doesn't seem so bad. Pat Novak for Hire was previously released by ABC, the American Broadcasting Company, for listeners in the United States and rebroadcast for our men and women overseas. This is the United States Armed Forces Radio.